First of all, can I say thanks very much for inviting me along. I enjoyed the previous three talks. It was quite an experience. Um, as you heard, I'm from Ireland and uh, just arrived into Atlanta yesterday. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be here. What I'm going to do is share my personal story with you. And it is a personal story. It's a journey that I am still on. And uh, I share my story in the hope that somebody somewhere can benefit from what I have to say. And of course, um, also that I can enlist support for what I'm doing as well. I come from Derry in Northern Ireland. I was born there in 1961. Around 1968, 69, when I was about eight or nine years of age, the area that I grew up on grew up in, changed significantly. And overnight, or what seemed overnight to me, my area and my city became a war zone. There was bombings, shootings, riots on an almost daily basis. I, um, I can remember standing in our street and counting the bombs that exploded in the city center. We lived up on the hill, so I used to run from one end of the street to the other to look down over the bog side in the city center to see the smoke bellowing up into the sky. Maybe there was a building on fire, a hijacked vehicle. My estate was completely barricaded in. There were burnt out vehicles across every entrance and exit to the, to the estate. And that was to stop the British Army and the police infiltrating the area. In January 1972, we had an incident in Derry that became known as Bloody Sunday, where 13 people were shot dead by British paratroopers. Many of those people came or, or lived within 30 seconds walk from my home. So as you can imagine, it was a very volatile area. I went to a primary school, or I could call it here an elementary school, and the elementary school and the high school were both on the edge of the Cregan estate. Beside the school was a police barracks, a police station. And because of where the police station was located, it was a target for the IRA and a target for riots on a daily basis. On the 4th of May, 1972, when I was 10 years old, I went to school as normal. I ran, I got out of school in the afternoon and I ran along the bottom of a soccer pitch. As I ran along the bottom of the soccer pitch, I had to pass a British Army lookout post that was here on my right-hand side. As I ran past it, a British soldier fired a rubber bullet. The rubber bullet hit me here on the bridge of the nose. I lost this eye and was left completely blind in my left eye. So I'm blind now almost 43 years. I can remember running towards the army lookout post. And the next thing I remember is I woke up and I was lying on the school canteen table where my music teacher, Mr. Giles Doherty, heard the bang. He ran up and found me lying on the ground, carried me in and laid me out on the table. The next thing I remember, I woke up in an ambulance. And at that stage, my daddy, or my father, and my sister were beside me. Um, I knew I was in an ambulance because I could hear the siren. My father was holding my hand. 
And he kept saying, you'll be okay, Richard. You'll be all right. Obviously, someone ran up to our house and told my father that I had been shot. And him and my sister came running down and jumped into the ambulance. At one stage, one of the ambulance personnel said to me, to my father, there's a woman outside. She's very upset. Will we let her in? And my father must have looked out the window when he said, no, it's his mother. Don't let her in. And the reason why he said that was because he didn't want my mother seeing me in the state that I was in. So I went to hospital. I spent two weeks in hospital. The first um, four days, I don't remember anything. Initially, they thought I was going to die from the injuries. Then they thought I might have had brain damage. And the final thing was, they told my parents that I would be blind for the rest of my life. For them, that must have been an awful shock. After about a week, they moved me out into the intensive care, out of intensive care into the general ward. And I remember there was a young boy in the bed opposite me. And uh, I was a, a soccer fanatic. I would have kicked a Coke can around the street just to play soccer. And I remember joking with a wee boy in the bed opposite me, saying to him, you know, when I get these bandages off my eyes, I'll teach you how to play football. And that must have been a terrible shock or a difficult thing for my family to deal with. I come from a big family. There were 12 children in our house, nine boys and three girls. I was the second youngest. And for them to hear me talking as if all I had to do was remove the bandages from my eyes and everything would be back to normal. It must have been very difficult. And they must have wondered, how are we going to tell Richard he will never play football again? How are we going to tell Richard he will never be able to see again? I got out of hospital after two weeks, and about a month after I was shot, my brother Noel took me for a walk up and down our back garden. And he said to me, do you know what has happened? And I said, yes, I knew I was shot. He said, do you know what damage was done? And I said, no. And that's when he told me that I lost my right eye and would never be able to see again with my left eye. And to be honest, I just accepted it like that. I literally took it in my stride that day until I went to bed that night. And when I was in bed on my own, I cried for the one and only time that I remember about blindness. And I cried because I realized for the first time that I was never going to see my parents' faces again. The 10-year-old boy, you don't think about the bigger things in life. You don't think about getting a job. You don't think about your education. You don't even think about how you're going to cope. I just felt this enormous sense of loss that I was never going to actually see my parents' faces again. And I cried myself to sleep that night. The next day, I woke up and got out of bed and began to put the pieces of my life back together. And I would always say that day was the first day of the rest of my life as a blind person. I eventually returned to the school I was at, done all my exams, went to university, uh, qualified with my degree in 1983. I got married in 1984. Got divorced in 1985. No, I'm only joking. I'm just checking these are all still there. <laughs> and uh, I have two children, Neve and Enya. Neve is 26 now, and Enya is 23. I'd done a lot of things after I was shot. I learned how to play the guitar, and I played in bands in Northern Ireland and throughout Ireland. 
Uh, me and my girlfriend then, my wife now, we set up a folk choir to sing at church on a Saturday night. And uh, I was compensated by the British for being shot. And with half the money, I bought a house. And with the other half, I bought a pub. And two years later, I bought a second pub. And if you know anything about the Irish, then a pub is a good investment. And uh, so I worked in my own business for about 14 years. I also kept my interest up in, uh, you know, in uh, football. I became a director of Derry City Football Club. And in fact, the last time Derry were champions of Ireland, I was a director, which is many years ago now. That was in the mid to late 90s. But why am I telling you all of that? Why am I sharing what you might consider my achievements as well as the challenges? It's to acknowledge the things in my life that allowed me not only to cope with blindness, but to turn blindness into a positive experience. And I think it's down to four things. And I'll mention the first three initially. First of all, I come from a good family. Second of all, I come from a good community. And thirdly, despite the poverty and the challenges that existed in Northern Ireland back in the 70s, I still had choices and opportunities available to me, even as a blind person. And during my self-employed years, I became very conscious of children in other parts of the world that might have had their eyesight, but didn't have what I had. Didn't have those opportunities. So I eventually sold out the business, and I set up an organization called Children in Crossfire. And Children in Crossfire was launched in 1996, which is almost 20 years ago now. Over those 18 or 19 or 20 years, we've supported projects in Africa, Asia, and South America, in countries like Malawi, Mozambique, Kenya, Colombia, Brazil, Bangladesh, Ghana, Guinea, and so on. Today, we work in Tanzania and Ethiopia, and we work with some of the most vulnerable children on the planet, children that suffer from the injustice of poverty. And I deliberately use that term, because for me, poverty is not an issue of charity. Poverty is an issue of justice. All as these children are asking for is the same protections and human rights that you and I would wish for our own children. Some of the images you're seeing up there are of a project in Ethiopia where we basically supported children and a, a community of 260 people who were living in a graveyard. The children, young girls, 70 years of age, were child prostitutes on the streets of Addis Ababa, selling their young bodies just to earn a few pence, a few cents to feed their families. They had no electricity, no running water, no food, no toilets. I'm delighted to say that today we have moved those families into small condominiums. The children now are attending school. There's a feeding program going on for the last six or seven years. And the parents are getting involved and being trained in income generating schemes such as broom making, uh, mushroom growing, etc. So eventually, by 2017, that community, those families, will be able to feed themselves. And I think at this point, I would like to just acknowledge um, Paul Gleason, who is here from 
the Atlanta Irish Consulate Office because Irish aid, which is the overseas aid part of the Irish government, has been supporting children in Crossfire almost since it started. So I'm delighted that Paul, uh, the, the Irish Consulate, was able to make it here today. Well, I'm not the only person that suffered as a result of my blindness. My parents suffered enormously. My parents were non-violent. They were two very devout Catholics. They went to Mass every day of their lives. My mother's brother was shot dead on Bloody Sunday, my Uncle Jared. And four months later, I was blinded by the British Army. So despite their best efforts to avoid the troubles, the troubles found us. And my parents were completely brokenhearted. My mother used to kneel beside my bed at night and say her prayers when she thought I was sleeping. And she'd be pleading with God to give me back my eyesight. And then she would break down and start to cry. And I would pretend to wake up and she'd pull herself together. My daddy, he stood in the street and cried the day he came back from the hospital when they told him that I was blind for life. And for different members of my family, they all have different stories to tell about how they dealt with my blindness. For me, I'm a happy and content to blind person, really. I never think about blindness, contrary to what you might think. I didn't wake up this morning and go all oh, blind the day again or go to bed the night blind the night again. And there's some good things about blindness, some positive things about blindness. For example, I don't have to look at you lot. <laughs> and doing this job here, it makes it a bit easier. And also when you're blind, you're in the receiving end of a lot of generosity and kindness. I relate to people in a different way from you. People relate to me in a different way from the relate to you. you no, know, for example, Brenton had to bring me up here and put me onto the stage. And if Brenton doesn't come back, if you come back this time tomorrow, I'll still be standing on this stage. <laughs> so I do rely on the kindness and generosity of people. And I love that. I love tapping into that. I never refuse help. And I'm not afraid to ask for help. But there are times in my life when it must be eyesight. For example, when my two daughters were born. I think you're looking at a photograph now of my daughters when they were born. You are able to do something that I have never been able to do. Been able to do. You are able to look at my children. When they were born, I would have given anything to see them. When they opened their eyes for the first time, I would have given anything to see them. When they made their first communions and their confirmations, and they walked up the aisle of the Craig and Chapel, and everybody telling me how beautiful they looked in their beautiful dresses, I couldn't see them. In those moments, I must be eyesight. In those moments, I thought about the British soldier that shot me. And I remember one time sitting in the chapel, thinking, does a British soldier ever think about me? Does he ever think about the legacy of what happened that day? But despite all of that, I never had a moment's anger or a moment's hatred towards a soldier or the British Army. If you think about anger, say I had been wrecked with anger. If I had been really angry, who do you think would have been affected most? If I had been angry, who do you think would have been affected most? Myself. Anger is like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. It destroys you from the inside out. It's a self-destruct emotion. And I'm glad I didn't have that. To the point where I wanted to meet the soldier. I didn't know his name until 33 years after I was shot. 2005. And his name's Charles. 
And in January 2006, I flew to Scotland on my own and met Charles for the first time. And he sat in a hotel foyer at a table opposite the man that blinded me for life and caused all those hurts to me and my family. And to like him was an incredible experience. And me and Charles talked for four hours and three quarters. And I have to be honest and say to you, it was one of the most fantastic experiences in my life. It's one thing to be able to forgive somebody. It's another thing being able to tell them you forgive them. And I learned two things about forgiveness that day. The first thing is, forgiveness is first and foremost a gift that you give to yourself. And what I mean by that is, forget about Charles. If he wants my forgiveness, he has it. But what's important for me in here, for my happiness, for my peace of mind, that I forgive him. So forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. Second of all, forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. And what I mean by that is, the fact that I forgive Charles will give me back my eyesight won't take away all those hurts that were caused to me and my family all those years ago. But what it did do and has done has changed my future. I don't believe that I would be the person I am today, standing here and talking to you, doing all the things that I've done with my life so far, if I had been wrecked with anger and bitterness. So forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change the future. And I think we all have a real challenge. And I know in a Northern Ireland context, where we are enjoying a peace process for the last 20 years, which is fantastic, but there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of sectarianism still underneath the surface. And we have this kind of hand-me-down type of anger and hatred handing down anger and hatred from one generation to the next generation, to the next generation. Somebody somewhere has got to break that cycle. I'll tell you a story about my mother. I remember, um, I remember being in our living room. And we lived in a small house. So whatever was done in one room, you heard it in the other room. And my brother, who was 16 years of age at the time, was out in the kitchen with my mother. And in very colorful language, and in a very angry way, he was saying to my mother, they murdered my Uncle Jared. They blinded Richard. We need to get our own back. There's no point in going to court. There's no point in looking for justice. You've got to get your own back. And my mother said to him, if you want to help Richard, go you in there and you help Richard. But you are not helping Richard by hurting somebody else. In that moment, I believe my mother drew a line in the sand. She changed the way the game should be played. She broke the cycle of hatred and anger. And she set out a new future. We can't always right the wrongs of the past, but we can use the past to help set a better future. And I think whether you're in your own personal life or whether you're living in a community like Northern Ireland, if you want reconciliation, it's got to happen in here first. It's got to happen with you first. Don't look for other people to provide the answers or the solutions. And for me, that is compassion and forgiveness at work. I am a victim of the Northern Ireland conflict. There is nothing I can do about that. But I refuse to be a victim of anger and hatred. 
And there's plenty I can do about that. You know, my mother prayed hard that I would get my eyesight back. Well, you know, and I know, I didn't get my eyesight back. But I believe I got a hell of a lot more out of life. And, you know, you can take away somebody's eyesight, but you can't take away their vision. And my vision is the work that I'm doing with children in Crossfire. And those children in Tanzania and Ethiopia and those communities have a lot to offer to the world. They have a lot to offer their communities. They just need a chance, the same chance that me and you have, to be able to contribute in a positive way and to be able to reach their potential. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.